Well, it's, it's a great pleasure to be invited to talk up here in Newmarket. Um, I live in Hertfordshire, so I've travelled through Essex to the edge of Suffolk. Um, we're just, I think, only past the mile, the sort of sign that says, Welcome to Suffolk, about two miles away from Newmarket. Um, and uh, my job, I think, is to talk about the UK and global economic outlook. I'm not an expert on anything to do with horses, I'm afraid, um, though I'm sure there are many people in the room who are. Um, though I think we have colleagues who've been helping you with some of your economic impact work over the last uh, few months. So um, really what I want to do is to set the context for the UK economy in uh, what's happening in the global economy. And um, those of you who are familiar with my background, um, I've been a business economist um, in the UK for over 30 years now, started my career in, C in the CBI in 1986, had a spell in the, on the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, and I also worked as chief economist at British Airways. And through that experience, one of the things that struck me is how interrelated the UK economy is with what's going on in the global economy. It's very difficult to uh, analyze the two separately. Um, though in fact, um, we're at a point now, partly due to Brexit, where the two are diverging to a much greater extent than we've seen for some time. So that's gonna be a sort of subtext of my presentation. But let's start with the global economy. Now, you'll all be familiar with the fact that we had a big financial crisis in 2008-9. Uh, you can see that the red line is world GDP as measured by the IMF. Um, big dip in 2009, bounce back in 2010, but actually when growth settled down after the crisis, it was much weaker than it was before the crisis. Uh, Joni Mitchell said in her famous song, Big Yellow Taxi, I'm sure very familiar to you all, you don't know what, what you've got till it's gone. In the sort of mid-2000s, we all thought that the world economy was chugging along at some sort of sustainable growth rate. In fact, as you can see from this chart, it was a, it was a mega boom supported by debt and all sorts of other financial issues. Um, so it's not perhaps a surprise that we've settled down at a more steady growth rate. And as you can see, the dotted line is a trend going back to 1980. We haven't been that far from that trend, slightly dipped below it. 2015, 2016, but we've actually now, uh, we're actually now into probably the best period of global growth that we've seen on a sustained basis, you know, adjusting um, apart from that sort of bounce back in 2010, 2011, that we've seen um, since the global financial crisis. But growth is, you know, it's, it's not going back to the sorts of rates that uh, we had before the crisis, and we should be grateful for that, because if we were rip-roaring away in the world economy, I think you would have to worry more about the fact that some sort of growth period will come to an end quite, quite soon. Uh, there, will be, there will be some sort of correction following this long period of growth. The recovery in the world economy and the UK has been going on for over nine years now, so we're into the 10th year of economic recovery. Um, those of you who are familiar with economic cycles know that sort of five to 10 years is a, seen by economists as a sort of, sort of normal period of growth before you get the next downturn. So you could say that we're starting to get into borrowed time and it would be very surprising if we got through to the mid 2020s, say 2025, without some correction in the world economy. But that's a way off. Um, at the moment, the short-term outlook for the world economy is pretty good. And inflation is fairly low. It's been picking up a bit here in the UK, even though the last, latest figures are 2.4%. Uh, that's above the Bank of England's target. In fact, out of the 10 major European economies, um, eight of them have inflation above 2% now. Um, and the United States has inflation getting close to 3%. Um, but those are modest fluctuations in inflation, to be quite honest. I started studying economics in 1974. I had a Saturday job at Boots the Chemist when I was in the sixth form at school. And when I turned up on the Saturday, my whole job 
1974 and 75 was repricing the goods. That's all I had to do because inflation was moving so rapidly and we had 20% plus inflation in that period. So we shouldn't get too exercised about 2 to 3% inflation, but it's, um, it's slightly higher, uh, as you can see in that yellow line, than we've seen uh, for some uh, period in the mid-2010s. Now, how does that look as if we look across the, the world economy as a whole? And you might ask the question, uh, Andrew, you've come along to tell us that the world economy is doing a lot better now than it was perhaps you know, two or three years ago. Why is that? And the answer, I think, is contained in this chart, which is where I, when I turn myself into Carol Kirkwood, the weather forecaster of the economic world, um, and show you a weather map of growth rates. And you can see that we don't have any negative growth rates on this chart. Uh, most of the figures are around about 2% or above. And the main message is that the three main um, uh, the three main regions of the world economy that contribute substantially um, to world GDP are performing pretty well. So that's North America, Europe, and in fact the biggest region now uh, for the world economy is the Asia-Pacific region. And there we have economies like China and India growing at 6.5%, uh, 7.5%. Um, other economies like Japan, Australia not doing quite so uh, well. But the Asia-Pacific region is now the largest region in the world economy, accounts for about a third of world GDP. And one of the reasons why Trump and various other people in the United States are getting very nervous about what's going on in Asia and in China is because they see the growing significance of China and the region around it, um, and it's basically seen as a bit of a threat to the United States, which has been the world's biggest economy since about the 1870s, so for about nearly 150 years when the US overtook the UK. In the 2020s, most economic forecasters agree we'll see an El Paso moment when China overtakes the US economy in terms of its overall size, um, and that's obviously challenging for people in the US who are used to strutting around the world uh, pretending that they're the top dogs. Now, there's been an exception to that trend of stronger growth. The UK, which has normally been one of the better performing economies in the G7 and in Europe, is growing pretty slowly at the moment. If we look in the G7, our growth over the last year is about 1.2%. Um, that compares with nearly 3% in the United States, nearly 2.5% in Canada, Germany, and France. We're even behind the Italians. You know, when people talk about what's going on in Italy at the moment, I say, don't worry about Italy. Nothing that's ever happened in Italy has changed the shape of the world economy for the last 50 years. They're always in a state of political turmoil, and their economy is always underperforming. But now, the, the poor old UK, UK economy is falling behind Italy, um, and we're not actually at the top of the growth league. We're closer to the bottom. And the question is, why is that? And there are two main reasons, which are both... Brexit related. The first is the pound took a big tumble when the Brexit vote was announced. Before that, the pound was worth about uh, 140 against the euro, 150 or 160 against the dollar, not far from par values that we've, we've seen for the last sort of 10, 15 years. It's now worth 113 against the euro. Uh, it's now worth about 130 against the dollar. It took a bit of a tumble yesterday. Um, and when the pound goes down, inflation picks up uh, because of higher imported prices. I guess in your industry, there are many things that are imported. You're quite sensitive to exchange rate movements. That affects your cost base, um, and that's been affecting the cost base for consumers across the UK. So inflation has picked up. It has picked up worldwide, but it picked up much more significantly and for longer in the UK. So if we go back to 2017, average, growth, average inflation rate has been about between 2.6 and 2.7%. Um, that has not generally been true in most other countries. And because inflation has picked up, consumers' purchasing power has been squeezed. Wages are only growing at about 25 to 3%. So when inflation is getting around about 25 to 3%, there's very little growth 
in uh, living standards and very little extra purchasing power for consumers. And so um, between 2014 and 2016, we have very low inflation, which gave consumers a bit of a boost, and retail sales were growing at 4 to 5% for most of that period. Uh, they've now been knocked quite heavily. We had some extra figures today, which I haven't quite, didn't have quite time to put on my chart, that show um, consumer spending has picked up a bit more strongly uh, over the last 12 months. But even so, it's probably close to that average blue line, uh, not uh, going significantly above it. So consumers have been squeezed by the fall in the pound and higher inflation, and also by rising inflation pressures globally. And then investment uncertainty has been introduced into the UK economy by Brexit. Businesses looking at the environment that they're going to be operating in, whether you agree with Brexit or not, know that it's not going to be quite the same in the next sort of three to five years um, and beyond that it was, that it has been um, over the last 40 to 44, 45 years when we've been in the EU. Now, one of the worst things in terms of business investment plans is uncertainty, because businesses always have the option of just putting that plan on hold, saying, yeah, well, it's a good thing to do, but let's see how things pan out, either politically or economically. So while we've got this fairly strong global economy, which is actually should be supportive of, of business investment, you can see that we've had um, a couple of years where business investment has been either below its long-term average or around its long-term average. And that followed a period when actually it was growing quite nicely at around about 4 to 5%. So both business investment and consumer spending have been hit by the short-term impacts of Brexit. Now, hopefully, both of those impacts will be to some extent temporary. But when we get through this sort of period of relatively weak growth, um, we should not expect UK economic growth to bounce back to the sorts of rates that we saw, if you look at the uh, left-hand side of that chart, that we saw before the financial crisis. From the late 90s to 2007, before the financial crisis, that decade, GDP grew by 3% and consumer spending grew by 4%. Those are very impressive figures for a mature economy like the UK. Um, we can't expect to go back to those rates of growth. So our medium-term forecast for looking to the 2020s, and we'll gradually start moving in this direction um, in 2019, will be for economic growth to be just below 2%, somewhere around 1.8%, and consumer spending to grow at that rate. Now, what I haven't factored in here is some sort of major recession which could happen over that period. So there is also that risk to bear in mind. Um, and you might ask, well, why, why is UK growth so disappointing? Well, first of all, we've seen a slowdown in growth rates across the Western world following the financial crisis. And the reasons for this are not properly understood. They're associated with slow productivity growth. Um, but so we're not unique here in the UK in looking forward to weaker growth than we might have expected uh, before the financial crisis. But the second factor is we've taken up a lot of the slack in the labor market in the UK. Unemployment is now down to its lowest level for over 40 years. And some of the supplies of labor that we've drawn upon in the past coming in from the EU are maybe not going to be so plentifully ava available um, in the future with the UK leaving the EU. We've already seen in the figures, we haven't left the EU yet. That doesn't happen until next year at the earliest. But we've already seen in the immigration figures that people have been more reluctant to come here to the UK because economic prospects have been very good in other countries and um, there's additional uncertainty about their status uh, because of the Brexit phenomenon. So yes, we will, we're likely to see a little pickup in growth uh, as we get into 2019 uh, and into the early 2020s. But growth is still going to be fairly, economic growth is going to be fairly subdued relative uh, to our experience before the crisis and also relative to that period in uh, the mid-2010s, 
2014, 2015, 2016, um, or actually 2013 to 2016, were actually quite a good period for the UK economy, and we were at the top of the G7 growth peak. Again, quoting Jenny Mitchell, we don't realize um, what we've got to it, it's gone. Not everybody was standing and, and sort of throwing their hands in the air and saying, what a great time that was. But when we look back at it, it actually looks a much um, better period than perhaps we recognized at the time. And that, is, in fact, is a, an important lesson for the Bank of England. The Bank of England started talking about raising interest rates around about 2013, 2014. It had some very good opportunities over that period to raise interest rates. Now, in August, the Bank of England will be considering whether to start the process of raising interest rates above 0.5%. They've been at 0.5% or below since March 2009. And you could argue, as we've seen in the United States, that they should have started this process perhaps when the, when the economic winds were fairer uh, in that mid-2010s period, when people were doing better, unemployment was coming down more rapidly, job prospects were much stronger, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, that's water under the bridge. So you might say, well, that's all very good, Andrew. You know, you and your fellow economists come up with these presentations. You tell us it's going well in the world economy. Perhaps the UK is not doing so well. Perhaps things will get a little bit better here in the UK, but um, uh, they're not going to get spectacularly good. I understand all that. I read that in the papers. I read it in The Economist. I read it elsewhere. What are the key risks and opportunities? And I think in the business world, this is something um, that you should increasingly be focusing on. So I've got here what I would say three short-term risks and opportunities and three long-term risks and opportunities. And these are not negative factors. They can cut both ways. Um, clearly, I've talked about the economic cycle. Um, we're in a good phase globally, not such a good phase in UK terms. But if we get through uh, the next few years with continued economic growth, that would be quite a good outcome. And that's an environment in which probably even the Bank of England, who's been reluctant to raise interest rates, will start pushing interest rates up, but only on a very gradual basis. The worst scenario for people in business and consumers would be if the bank is boxed into a corner, either because the pound collapses or something else happens, and they, they are, feel obliged to raise interest rates more rapidly. That's the scenario that they should be trying to avoid, but it's still a risk. We've got a much more talk about uh, trade disputes, protectionism led by Donald Trump uh, in particular. And I see Brexit as a bit of a manifestation of that as well. Brexit is going to result in us having less good trade relations with our key partners in Europe in the short term, definitely. Exactly how that manifests itself is unclear, but it's, you know, it's unlikely we can just leave the EU and keep everything exactly as it was. Theresa May's white paper is an attempt to try and keep us as close as possible for certain areas of the economy, uh, producing goods, manufacturers, and agriculture, not so uh, ambitious for services, where there's a recognition that we will probably have less good trade terms with the rest of the EU. So we're moving into a world we've, we've taken advantage over the last 20, 25 years of an opening up in the world economy. And the UK has benefited greatly from that. That opening up is in danger of going into reverse. And if the bandwagon that Donald Trump seems to be pushing of trying to um, create more barriers to trade and to isolate the American market from other countries, if that gathers momentum and it becomes a global trend as it did in the 1930s, that is definitely a negative thing. We've got a very unstable political situation. I mentioned that I started studying economics in the mid-70s. One of the things that attracted me was what a volatile economic and political time it was. Those of you who, who remember it, I'm sure there are many people uh, in the room who remember it. We are now in the most unstable and volatile political situation we have seen since the late 70s. We haven't had this type of minority government, for example, since the late 70s when uh, the Labour Party was in government and reliant on votes from the Liberal Party. Um, you can cast your mind back to that time about all the sort of various forms of uh, political volatility that we had. People being wheeled into Parliament 
uh, from their sick beds in order to get the government's business through. Well, there were some echoes of that in some of the votes that we've had over the last few days on Brexit. Um, and standing in the wings is a, is a much more left-wing version of the Labour Party than we saw when they were last in power uh, under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Now, it's, it's very uncertain what a Labour government might look like if they were elected to power. One of the things that would sort of restrain them is that it's very unlikely that they would be elected to power as a majority, and therefore they would de be dependent on votes from other parties, which might act as a restraining force. But even so, we've seen across the world all sorts of political upheavals over the last two to three years. Trump elected in the United States. Macron, a guy coming from nowhere, elected as president of, the, uh, of France. Uh, political turmoil in Italy. You've got Germany where uh, Angela Merkel has lost her grip on power. Uh, a relative outsider, Trudeau, got, was elected as, as the president of Canada or the prime minister of Canada. So we're in a period of quite sort of um, significant political change and we shouldn't rule out the fact that that will maybe shift the traditions of the UK government um, from the situation where the Conservatives have been the natural party of government. And then there's three longer term factors that I've just put on your radar. Technology is shaping the world in which we live in um, and it's creating disruptive change in many industries. We look at the positive side of it, but we can also see the negative sides like cybercrime uh, and, and things like that. Climate change is, is a reality now, I think. Uh, it's widely recognized that the world is warming, up, is warming up and we will see the impacts of climate change. Every major country apart from the United States is virtually signed up to address that. And that is beginning to have quite significant influences on the way in which businesses are thinking. Electric cars might have seen a pipe dream you know, about 10 or 15 years ago, are becoming something that's mainstream in the motor industry. And then demographics, an aging population. Uh, now, maybe for your industry, you know, the notion that everyone's sitting at home watching the racing on the television, uh, putting a bet on, is probably a, a positive thing. So we shouldn't see demographics as being negative. Um, it's the way in which we adapt to it as an economy and society. So there's some of the key risks and opportunities. Um, I suppose my message would be that many of these things will take a while to feed through. So the short term, even though the UK is not performing that brilliantly, the short term UK and global economic outlook is quite respectable. But when we get into the early 2020s, we may find that some of these uh, chickens will come home to roost. Some of these issues may create a less um, benign economic outlook than we currently see. Thank you very much.